I am thrilled to have Katie Durham joining us in the Brilliant Minds Bunker today. Katie is a BBC Radio 3 presenter and the face of the BBC Proms. Welcome to the bunker, Katie. Thank you very much. A very nice bunker it is too, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was just thinking the same about yours, actually. <laughs> um, Katie, since lockdown, you've continued to deliver BBC Radio 3's Drive Time programme in tune. Do you think your audience's relationship with radio has changed during lockdown? I think you're absolutely right. I think it has changed, or perhaps better to say it's intensified. I think people have a very warm relationship with radio programmes and radio stations and indeed with presenters anyway, because of the intimate nature of the way you absorb radio programmes. I think that more so perhaps than TV or other sorts of media, you, you tend to listen to radio on your own. And I think that does make you feel very close, having that voice in the room. I think what has really noticeably changed for me is how close I feel to the audience at this time, because there is this sense, as I think we've all had, whatever walk of life we're in, of all being in it together. And the fact that I have been broadcasting from uh, a friend's little office, which had good broadband and a, and a quiet room that I could plug my kit into and, and, and connect directly then with hundreds of thousands of people, all of whom wanted to listen to the same sort of music that I like listening to and, and be taken away, I think, from the very strange and often upsetting situation that we found ourselves in in the last three months. That has felt a very warm and lovely thing actually to be part of that community and to really feel at one with, with the people who I know have been regular listeners and loyal listeners anyway, but somehow more than ever, that sense of sharing and that sense of music being an escape has been really powerful. And have you done anything specific in terms of changing the way you would run your programme to meet these, these new needs? Oh, of course, because I mean, Intune has always prided itself on being the home of live performance on uh, Radio 3. You know, normally we have at least two groups or soloists in the studio, in, whether it's in Maida Vale or in Broadcasting House in Central London. Of course, that isn't possible. But what we have been able to do is, and I think, you know, the BBC broadly has been being brilliant at, at continuing its role as a sort of a, a guardian of the country culture in a way, is we have been commissioning some of our regular, lovely, friendly guests and musicians to be making home recordings, home sessions we've been calling them. And it's been part of the BBC Culture and Quarantine initiative. And so every day since about week two of lockdown, uh, we have had a world-class musician has been recording something at home and then we have premiered it on the radio. And I think we've seen across the board a lot of musicians and artists and, and uh, you know, performers generally um, doing their own thing online and this has been a fundamental change in the way that a lot of us have consumed arts and culture uh, in the last few months but I feel very proud that Radio 3 has been at the forefront of this and, and also that we've been able to keep some musicians going because we have been commissioning to do this it's not been a freebie we have been paying them and believe you me freelance musicians are struggling at the moment. I was going to ask you about that because you're obviously in regular contact with professional musicians. How, how are they doing? I mean, it must be really, really tough. You know, I don't think you go into music generally or classical music, perhaps in particular, or jazz, world music, folk, all the things that I deal with regularly. You know, you don't do it for the cash. I mean, generally you do it for the love, almost a compulsion to be in that world. You know, it's not a well-paid profession at the best of times and it's very precarious. It's pretty much constantly freelance. There are a few orchestras where you might get a long-term contract or a staff job, but broadly you are a freelance musician. So when the concerts stop, the money stops too. And I know some extremely, uh, I mean, household names almost, who are really worrying about their mortgages, of course, because, you know, their diaries went from being packed around the world, you know, this one, this sort of brilliantly itinerant lifestyle that most musicians have, to being completely empty. And so they are, uh, responding creatively but there is an underlying kind of desperation amongst a lot of them. I know I was reading recently um, that they were you know trying to put together like a drive-through Lab OM at Alexandra Palace and things like this I, I mean I you're hearing that people are trying to be creative but it, it must it must be incredibly tough. Um, can I ask you about your wonderful career um, in the media? Um, I want to know is there anything that's sort of stuck out for you over those years in, in media that has sort of significantly changed you know your career progression? Are there any moments that you look back and think that was a big game changer for me. 
you know, they, it's from the sublime to the ridiculous, really, because yes, I, I certainly could tell everybody out there there was never really a plan. Uh, there was always a, a, an interest in the media and in broadcasting and in journalism. I started off as a news journalist, a business journalist, first of all. But there were two particular things that happened along the way over the last 25 years. The first was, I was a business uh, programme presenter at Radio 5 Live, when 5 Live just started in the mid 90s. And I was in the right place at the right time. And I was inexperienced and probably a bit rubbish but I was presenting a program and uh, I did my first ever bit of press and uh, this was great excitement and I did this interview over the phone with the journalist I think it was Sunday Times me and my money and uh, I in that conversation I was asked what's your best bargain been and I just bought myself a coat in the sales you know bear in mind I was sort of 25 at the time so this was quite a big deal you know shopping for clothes uh, still is and um, the, yeah. And I said, in passing, I said, oh, my radio colleagues call it my telly coat because it was quite, you know, a glam sort of coat. And the next day after that article was published, I got a phone call from somebody at BBC Television saying, you know, who was quite a senior manager there saying, oh, I read the article. Are you interested in television? Would you like to come in for a chat? So that was a very wow. throwaway, lucky moment, which then led to me getting offered a job as a, a reporter on the film programme, Barry Norman's film programme, which was, I mean, a dream. Um, but then fast forward about 10 or 12 years, I suppose, and, and I'd been a newsreader at ITN, and I was asked uh, if I wanted to take part in a reality show called Maestro, which was uh, about conducting, where you learn to conduct a BBC concert orchestra. And having spent the previous 15 odd years in hard news, uh, business news first and then into general news, um, it re-engaged me with my youth, which was spent playing a lot of music. And I had always loved music. I'd always been in orchestras and played. I mean, I was never you know, professionally good or anything, but I was a good amateur and I loved it. And uh, that whole experience of doing that reality show and learning to conduct an orchestra made me think, goodness, I would, I would, I just liked being around musicians actually and being around music again. And I just said to the production team at the end of the run, um, listen, if anything comes up, the BBC or anywhere that you hear of in terms of me doing any more music stuff, then just let me know. And a couple of, it took a couple of years, but a couple of years after that, uh, I got a call saying, you know, that they wanted to revamp the proms and would I be interested in presenting the proms? And I, it took me about, I'd say five seconds, <laughs> less, three seconds to say yes. Okay. So that again, completely swerved then my career onto another path. Wow. So I know you play the piano and the violin, but I mean, conducting the BBC concert orchestra, I mean, what, what did you learn from doing that? I couldn't think of anything more terrifying. <laughs> It, it certainly was terrifying. You know, it's a fascinating organism, an orchestra, and the conductors play a very specific role. And it's 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 not one I'd ever given, or I'd never had to give it much thought before. I suppose I thought they acted as a leader or, or certainly a timekeeper, um, almost like a traffic policeman in a way, <laughs> you know, making sure the right people did the right thing at the right time. It was only when I had to do it myself that I realised that, of course, you've got 70 highly talented individuals in an orchestra who are looking to whoever's standing on the podium to give them direction but musical direction not just what notes to play and when they can do that they can read the music they know these pieces mostly backwards right so they were looking to us to have a view it was like having a musical opinion and then crucially for me as a newsreader at the time and a journalist not using words to communicate that but communicating through gesture and expression so I had to learn to have the confidence of my convictions musically, which was really tough because I felt like a complete imposter, which was the entire premise of the program. Um, but then I had to learn to shut up. And having been uh, in a job where I had to be by profession, neutral and impassive and not show emotion as a newsreader, I then had to suddenly, you know, emote and, and find that very dare I say, un-English thing of, you know, showing emotion, sharing emotion and trying to work out physically how that was going to come across. And it was, it was really, really tough, but extremely uh, absorbing. Really, I, I learned a lot and I think it, it taught me quite a lot about myself and I enjoyed it very much. I wasn't desperately successful at it, but I mean, I did okay. And I, as I've always, I, and I now watch conductors in a completely different way because I know how well prepared they have to be, how completely in the music and the score they have to be. They have to know everything. And yet they have to, within 10 seconds, five seconds of walking onto the podium, they have to convince that orchestra that they know what they're doing and that they're going to be taken in a certain direction. I think it's amazing what they do. Wow. Yes, I, as I say, utterly terrifying, but, uh, <laughs> but you've done it and I haven't. Um, <laughs> 
Charlotte Higgins wrote a really interesting article last week in The Guardian, and it was entitled, Are We Going to Let Classical Music Die? What do you think we should be doing to support the arts more during this period of time? I think that we have to have an extremely urgent and serious discussion with the powers that be about the way the arts are funded in this country. I think that you can rely on the practitioners and the commentators to be creative, to come up with new, as you say, drive through Lab OMs, online festivals. But if you look at our colleagues around the world, certainly in the rest of, uh, of Europe, in Germany, for example, most arts institutions, orchestras and the like, have about 80% public funding. Here, we're lucky to have 20%. Now, I am not suggesting that everybody shouldn't be, as I say, coming up with creative business partnership solutions. But right now, we are looking at about the next three to six months, I'd say, we, should, we will probably see some of our finest arts institutions go bust. There is no way to make money if you haven't got people coming in to buy tickets to go and see the concerts. If you don't have the venues open, if you don't have the productions being put on, the musicians can't, the performers, the dancers, the actors cannot make any money. And the few who may be starring in the Netflix show or who may be selling a lot of records, they're fine for them, but where are the next generation gonna come from? Where are all the other, the session musicians? Where, are the, you know, the, the backing singers, everybody who in this enormous and enormously successful and economically important sector, how are they going to survive? So. I don't know if we're going to be talking about tax breaks. There have been various um, suggestions put forward by some of the leading lights of the industry. I mean, Sam Mendes uh, came up with quite a, uh, I thought, a good plan for the way you could come up with incentives um, for venues to stay open. Or it could just be cash bailout. But something has got to give. You know, I think we're, 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 a, we're a benevolent country. We're a country that appreciates our culture. But, you know, there is a limit to how much somebody like the BBC, something like the BBC can do to save an entire ecosystem of drama, dance and music. I, you know, it can't do it alone. We're doing a lot, but we can't do it alone. So I think that there needs to be an, but it needs to be an urgent situation. And it's tricky, I think, for sometimes the public to say, well, yes, but, but everybody needs money at the moment. We're going to face an enormous economic downturn and any public money ought to be going to doctors and schools. Well, yes and no. You know, what are we living for? In my view, life wouldn't be anywhere near as enjoyable if we didn't have this vibrant cultural life around us. Um, and I think we all secretly agree with that. Yeah, I mean, you, you only have to look at newspapers to see how important music has been to people's mental health <laughs> and their ability to cope with situations, all those softer things that perhaps aren't quite as meaty or as an interesting thing to talk about, but yet important, really, really important. We're running out of time, sadly, but I just want to ask a really cheeky question. I have to ask this. If you hadn't landed Anton de Beck in the strictly... <laughs> 2015 series who would you have chosen who would have been on your oh, wish list oh well now i mean you know i could be making and losing friends with saying this um i mean i was i must say delighted to get the legend that was dubec that is dubec uh, who has stayed a very good friend i must say and i had the best time with him but um i also did become very fond of aliash and jeanette and uh, I did have the pleasure of dancing with Aliash at, um, we did a Strictly prom the year after I'd been in Strictly and uh, Anton sadly wasn't around to, to dance at it. So, you know, shame, I had to dance with Aliash. Um, and I must say that was very pleasant. <laughs> the not the not unlovely Aliash, <laughs> who's also the nicest man in the world. But <laughs> Fantastic. Katie, it's been an absolute joy talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing some of your stories and thoughts and, and actually for bringing some much needed awareness to the plight of the arts because we need to talk about this stuff too. But uh, thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Bye bye.